guys, welcome to another episode of Bikini and the Brain. This is going to be a solo episode. I am Ashley Liss today. <laughs> she is with Angel's Bikini, uh, Angel Bikini Competition. Uh, they are doing a photo shoot in Florida today, but the show must go on Ashley Liss or not. So we decided, I asked Ashley about it too. We decided, you know what would be a good, a good idea would be to just go into some questions from you guys today and go into them a little bit in depth. And I'm just answering them as they come on uh, through Instagram and also um, some that I asked you the day in my story. So if you ever see those, I do answer most of those questions on the stories and also through text. I've gotten quite a few too, which I'll answer those. And usually I just answer those directly to the person asking. So anyway, let's just jump right into it. I don't think there's any uh, <laughs> anything too exciting going on. I also have my assistant here today, Coach Dudes. You guys can see little Coach Dudes. <laughs> He jumped in on the podcast, so uh, I'm allowed to when Ashley's not here to have the dog. To have the dog, and she's not biggest. She said the dog distracts her a little bit uh, when she's doing the podcast. Okay, so first question I got was from Lydia um, on Instagram. This question is: uh, Can too much walking affect your lower body muscles? Okay, so um, that's a good question, and I think it's one that people don't really dive into the right way. And I'm going to go into this one in a, in actually a pretty decent, well, decent common sense detail that people don't really talk about. So first off, here's the argument that we get from everyone. Okay, so in, in bodybuilding, you'll see bodybuilders doing a lot of walking, a lot of low intensity, steady state cardio, okay? And this is where the problem comes in is that you see these giant muscular bodybuilders doing steady state cardio for hours on end, not losing any muscle or at least very minimally losing muscle and then getting shredded, right? And these are sometimes either the same guys that are coaches. Some of the coaches will actually be like bodybuilders and they'll try to prepare bikini competitors like this. So if you look at it just at looking at it, okay, that bodybuilder, he gets shredded by doing, you know, hours and hours of cardio and he's eating low calories, but he's not losing any muscle, that's probably the best way to do it. Because if a guy that big can hold on to that much muscle, then I definitely can hold on to that much muscle because I don't even have as much as that guy. So it's easier to lose when you have an excess than close to your baseline, right? That's the, that's the theory. So a lot of times these bodybuilding coaches that were bodybuilders in themselves will approach bikini preps that same way. And they'll approach bikini preps, say, okay, let's give this girl two hours of cardio, really low calories. It worked for, you know... Phil Heath, <laughs> right? It worked for Ronnie Cohen, worked for all my bodybuilder friends and me when I was bodybuilding, right? So it's going to work for her. Well, it's a different, it's a totally different scenario. And that's what the thing we got to think about. Okay. So if you're a bikini girl, it's a, a lot different than being a bodybuilder, a lot different. So we got to, so we got to first disassociate those two because they're different things. They're not the same thing. They're on the same stages, but it's a different thing. It's a different category. So and the reason, the main reason is, is that a lot of bikini competitors, you know, I would say, you know, a, a large majority of bikini competitors are natural athletes, right? And that's really the, the difference, right? If you have a bodybuilder doing two hours of cardio, holding on to all his muscle, and some of them are actually growing during prep, well, they're taking things that bikini girls aren't taking that allow them to do that. So when you approach a bikini prep, it has to be different. It has to be a different approach. Now, let's look at things in like the natural environment and not compare them to an enhanced environment, right? Do people who do excessive cardio, excessive walking, do they have physiques that you admire, right? Is that a physique that you would want to throw on an NPC IFBB stage? The answer to that is no. Marathon runners, long distance runners, even marathon walkers, right? In like the Olympics, do they have a physique that's built for um, you know, having a good amount of muscle and having, um, being able to be really strong, or they have a physique that is designed to run and go for long periods of time and have really good oxygen recruiting abilities to carry your body for long periods of time, which means that you're going to have less muscle, right? So that's the reason that you don't want to be doing excessive cardio and why the example of the bodybuilder is necessary, right? Because the argument's always that. The argument's always, well, this bodybuilder got really muscular and really lean, um, doing three hours of cardio and eating, you know, a thousand calories, right? So I should do that too as a bikini competitor. No, that is a different thing. It's, it's, it's still in the bodybuilding sport, but it's pretty much an entirely different sport. You know, it's just on the same stage. And so we can't really use them as examples because it's a totally different thing. You're essentially taking 
someone who's turned themselves into superhumans and then comparing them to like a bikini competitor and being like, oh, I should do the same things they do. Well, no, <laughs> it's a different thing. Like it just, just how it, how it works. So when you're looking at doing, you know, cardio as a bikini competitor, I'm trying to keep the glutes full. I'm trying to keep the legs full. I'm trying to minimize how much cardio I do. I know the more cardio I do, the more likelihood I, I am to becoming, to creating more of that endurance-based physique that is going to be, that's going to replicate the, what you're doing. So whatever you're going to do, your body's going to ad- adapt accordingly to it. So if you're lifting really heavy weight and you're doing power lifts and you're doing, you know, all these things, your body's going to adapt how? It's going to get stronger, Right. So if you're doing really endurance-based things, how do you think your body's going to adapt? It's going to get more endurance. It's going to it's going to adapt the way you train it to adapt. So if you're doing long-distance cardio for hours on end, how does the body adapt to that? Well, it becomes more efficient at doing that. Okay, so instead of having, you know, these really big, strong, bubbly, white muscle fiber, you know, uh, muscles that can lift a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of weight for short periods of time, it's going to be developed muscles that can get oxygen better, red muscle fibers that can go for longer periods of time and longer walks. So it's just common sense. You're going to train your, however you train is how your body's going to look. So I will try to minimize how much cardio I do for those people. I'm not going to look at it in the bodybuilder way when I'm comparing it to a bikini competitor. And even with a men's physique guy, I won't too, because the men's physique guys aren't going to be doing the same things that like bodybuilders are on. You know, bodybuilders are on these days are on like 10 plus compounds. That's why I don't do any bodybuilding anymore. Um, so it's just something you guys got to think about. You know, you have to approach your training to how you want to look and you have to look at things not like the the old bodybuilder approach. Bikini approach is totally different. And that's why you have bikini expert coaches that aren't specializing in bodybuilding expert coaches and bodybuilding expert coaches that don't know what to do in bikini. And it's funny, you hear that all the time and I'll get a lot of bodybuilders that'll be like, how do you even do it? How do you, I'm like, dude, it's not the same thing. It's a different animal, you know? So anyway, that is, uh, that is my, my take on that one. Uh, all right, let's go into the next question here. And I'm, I don't have any uh, specific format. I'm just trying to uh, just go into them all the time. Okay, this is actually a funny question. This question is, what's the, what's the worst client I ever had? <laughs> the worst client I ever had? You know what? The, the, I would say the only bad client really I would have is one that doesn't take responsibility on their part, you know? In coaching, there's going to be two people that are responsible. Right? I'm, I'm responsible for giving the best possible program that I could create within my abilities, right? That's something that I'll always do. And I take a lot of pride behind it. Um, I've gotten, you know, I've gotten pretty good at it at this point. And I'm always going to deliver what I think is currently the best thing within my abilities, right? But the client's job is to adhere to that plan. The worst thing is having a client who doesn't adhere to the plan and doesn't tell you they adhere to the plan. That'll be the worst client, even if they're the sweetest person in the world, because now the trainer is going to make adjustments based on what he thinks that client is doing. And then that whole time the client's like, oh, I wasn't, I was cheating on my diet. I wasn't doing all my cardio. I wasn't working out as intensely as I said I was. And then the coach is over here. I'm over here trying to figure this out. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? Why isn't this working the way it should be working? Maybe it's this, maybe it's this. And we're trying all these things and they're just not like fessing up. That's the worst client. So what I will say to all you out there, even though it may be hard, even though it sucks to say it, you got to tell your coach, you got to be honest with your coach because they're going to make adjustments based on what they think you're doing. And if they're, if you're not following the plan, it's just better to tell them, Hey, I didn't follow my plan. I fell off a little bit versus them making these huge adjustments and trying to play catch up with you and trying to figure it out. That's happened to me multiple times where girls would even like lie to me about their measurements and stuff. Like that's, it's just unnecessary because I'm not going to get mad, you know, but um, you know, people are self-conscious about it. Okay. Okay. So let's go into so I got like probably a hundred questions here. I would say something like that, right, Arthur? There's like a ton of questions that came in, which is cool. Um, all right, so this is a good question for everyone competing. Like, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Sorry, getting these funny, getting these funny questions. My girlfriend's jumping in on here. Answers <laughs> <laughs> quiz questions. Uh, so, all right. So, uh, do you suggest posing in the off season? You've heard it can build bad habits. Um, I don't know of any bad habits it'll build. Um, I think that you should always be practicing your posing. I think that it's important because it's a lot of, a lot of posing is just flexibility and, and muscle memory, right? So always practicing is important. The problem with posing in the off season for like a coach is that we can't see your lines. We can't see certain things. You can't see your tie-ins and what this looks like and what that looks like. So for me, I, I prefer to see people at like eight weeks out when I'm starting to see them pose 
because I could see things, you know, and I can adjust their posing according to how their lines actually look versus what I think they'll look like when they show up. So for me, it's like, yeah, I want to see your posing way out, but it's more of just the basics. And then when we get you like within eight weeks, that's when I want to start seeing the posing videos. That's when I have them start doing their posing with the posing coaches and stuff too, because I really want to see like, okay, we need to adjust this because her tie-ins don't look as good, whatever. So um, let's go ahead and go into the car. I think we can go into another cardio question that we got, which is because it's kind of turned into, I guess it's kind of turning into a longer part uh, cardio podcast, right? So, all right. So this question comes in from we live big, love bigger, right? We live big, love bigger. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Instagram name. All right. So it says steady state cardio or hit when and why? Okay. So this is a good question because I've gone, gosh, I've gone so many times back and forth on the hit cardio and steady state cardio and been in so many different phases of my like career in terms of what I think is the best form of cardio. Um, and there's a lot of different scenarios that are going to be for hit cardio and for steady state. So let's go back into that earlier question of, okay, should I do steady state for long periods of time? And does that make you lose muscle, right? Well, the more endurance activity you do, the more likely you are to lose muscle or build an endurance-based physique. We already established that. And there's no way to kind of de debate that, you know, and if anyone's going to ever try to debate that with you, be like, okay, who looks, who looks better, a sprinter or a marathon runner? Who, who would you rather look like? And the answer is always going to be the sprinter. They have more muscle, they're lean, they're developed for short periods of explosive movements, right? So when does it make sense to do steady state cardio versus, uh, versus hit cardio, all right? So this, let's go into some scenarios. So the scenario one would be, okay, someone's too muscular in their quads, right? If they're too muscular in their quads, am I going to give them sprinter type activity that might make them slightly more muscular in their quads? No, that doesn't make sense. So I'll give that person, you know, endurance based cardio, maybe even try to bring their legs down by doing more cardio, right? So that girl who's kind of bordering on wellness, but isn't, you know, just a little bit past bikini, she's going to be the girl that gets that steady state cardio probably for longer periods of time. You know, maybe that'll be the girl that gets an hour of cardio, something like that. Um, is someone crushing their legs all the time, right? Let's say I, here's a, here's a weird scenario. Let's say I have someone who needs to build a lot of glutes and legs. I need, they need to build a lot. So I'm having them, they've worked up their abilities to be able to train legs hard three times a week. Should I, even though they need to build their legs up, should I really give this girl hit cardio and do even more, uh, more taxing on their nervous system by doing hit cardio four or five days a week on top of three really hard leg days? Maybe for periods of time, right? But unlikely she's going to be able to sustain the intensity of her, her lifts three times a week with full intensity with also doing full intensity hit cardio five times a week, right? So maybe for short periods, I'll give that girl hit cardio and mostly give her steady state cardio, even though it's going against exactly what I said I don't want to do, which is get a girl with small muscles, small legs, give her endurance-based activities, right? So it's going to be scenario-based. The one thing about hit cardio is it's really, really taxing on, on the person's mind. It's taxing on their nervous system. It's, it does affect their recovery a bit. So you got to be willing to sacrifice a little bit of, a little bit of, you know, something for the other. So if I think the person isn't doing anything intense enough in the gym and I see them, like I'll have people send videos to me of their like their best set type of thing and it's not that intense and I, I think that that person can handle hit cardio. So I might give them hit cardio more than I give that person steady state cardio because at least they'll get their intensity through that and I know they're not taxing themselves enough with the workout, right? So it's just different for different scenarios, but in the in the basics of things um, what I like to say is, you know, if I can get away with just doing minimal amount of cardio and hit helps with that, then I'll do that. Um, I'll go to hit before I'll go to steady state, but also at the same time, if someone's working out really, really hard, I'll probably just do steady state just to get their steps up. So there you go. Um, it's still that, that answer that honestly, we can go on for an hour just on, just on that alone. You know what? We're going to go into actually another cardio question. This is, I am Ms. Aura Garcia. All right. So <laughs> that's a lot. These, these Instagram names are so hard to pronounce, right? <laughs> Says, uh, this question goes, if you are, if you are making 27,000 steps a day or daily due to your activity at work, is it still necessary to do cardio at 27,000 steps a day? I would probably say no. 
to most people doing 27,000 steps a day, I would say no. Honestly, when someone starts reaching the 15,000 steps a day marker, I tend to start pulling cardio at that point. Because if, unless you're doing something drastically different for your cardio, you're kind of doing a lot of cardio already. So I have a client, um, he's a, he has a, I have a client named Steve here, and he does that. Like for he's in the military, so he would actually get in sometimes like 200,000 steps a week type of thing. Uh, I think sometimes he would get in more than that actually. And, um, and it was like, well, adding is, so let's take the example, 27,000 steps. I don't know. I forget the number on top of my head. I thought it was 5,000 steps was a mile, maybe like 5,500. So this girl's like walking five steps a day. Can we Google that? Can we Google steps in a, in a mile? I just want to get that right. So, um, how many steps are in a mile? Yeah. Um, so when I'm, when I have someone doing, oh, dang, I was way out too. The good thing I asked, <laughs> that was 2,000 steps. Jeez. So, okay. So Miss Garcia here, she's doing 27,000 steps. Arthur says there's 2,000 steps in a mile. So we're talking 13 miles. She's walking. Okay. So if I give her an extra mile of cardio, right? Let's say I give her an extra mile of cardio, an extra two miles of cardio even. Is it really going to do that much for her if it's steady state? It's not really, right? So she's already worked up so high that it's going to be really a calorie thing, right? We're just trying to shift a calorie balance. And I think that we get a little lost in contest prep. Actually, I know that we get a little lost in contest prep. Um, like, let's break it down to the basics. You know, let's break it down to the basics. What are we trying to do in contest prep? We're trying to lose a little bit of body fat, right? And if you had a good off season and you're actually doing this fitness thing right, you shouldn't have to go through this huge transformation every single time you prep. You should have to lose, like as a bikini competitor, you should have to lose like 10, 12 pounds, you know, to get ready for a show. So why are we, why are we going to this point where we need to do two hours of cardio? Why are we going to this point where we need to eat just tilapia for eight weeks and do two hours of cardio, right? Like what's going on in your off season that you need to address to make sure that you don't have to go through that again? Why do we need to do all this cardio if we're just trying to lose a pound a week? You know, it should be, hey, you know, like uh, the other day, Anya posted, she's like, we're notorious for doing eight-week preps. You know, um, Ashley, we're doing three-week preps because she's staying lean. You know, so that's going to be one of the things. You have to think about, okay, why, right? Not just do, and that's what usually it is with, with contest prep. People usually just do. Okay, I'm doing contest, so now I need to eat just tilapia, do cardio fasted for 45 minutes in the morning, cardio after I work out for 45 minutes, eat just tilapia and asparagus, and that's just contest prep. That's just the way it is. That's not the way it is, right? If you keep your body fat under control, if you have to lose 10 pounds to get ready for a show, you lose one pound a week for 10 weeks to get ready for a show, then you don't have to worry about all this crazy cardio and worry about all these little things. You just have to lose some body fat. It's really simple. It's not like, it's not that crazy, you know? So anyway, that being said, if you're doing 20, 27,000 steps a day, I really don't think that any more cardio than that is going to be really a big benefit. And honestly, um, it might start hurting you a little bit too. You might get into that more endurance-based activities where your body is starting, you're kind of fighting you on building muscle. Because your body, when you're doing a lot of walking around and a lot of endurance-based activities and walking for miles and miles a day, the way that your body's going to get worse at walking miles and miles a day is by having more lean tissue to supply oxygen to on a daily so your body is trying to become efficient at what you're doing to it. If you're training where you're doing a ton of steps all the time, it's going to be a little harder for you to build muscle. Um, it's just the reality of things because you're doing more endurance-based activities, right? So anyway, you should be able to create a contest prep with just your steps if that's how many steps you're taking. Honestly, if you're, if you're past 15,000 steps, you really shouldn't have to do much cardio at all. So especially if you're keeping lean, if you're keeping lean in the off season and you're doing, let's say, 15,000 steps, I doubt you'd have to ever do cardio within your prep, like probably pretty minimally if you did any added cardio. So, okay. Oh, this is a good question. I like this question, actually. I'm going to go for it. Um, do you see value in someone competing if they're not exactly fitting the standard look yet? So that's a good, that is a really good question. Um, so there's two sides mm -hmm. of this, and there's like an evolution that I've gone through on this too. And so... I've had a, I actually had someone ask me the other day, they're like, hey, I want to prep for like a beginner competition and I don't really care if I'm ready, right? Well, I had to tell her, hey, there's no such thing as a beginner, beginner competition. It's a, they're open to anyone at any time. There's not like you, you, you're only permitted if you're a beginner to do a contest. Now, they have novice divisions and first time ever novice divisions, but those girls all compete in the open division too. They're usually ready for it. So, it's pretty rare where someone just shows up and they're like right in the beginning of their weight loss journey, right? 
So that's the one thing I will say. This is not a weight loss contest. Um, they have weight loss contests. They have transformation contests. You probably want to save that for those. You probably don't want to be on stage halfway through your transformation, you know? But at the same time, if you've made a huge transformation and let's say your physique is just, you know, you're never going to be the Olympia champion. Your, your genetics just aren't there. You've lost 50 pounds. You probably have to lose 60 pounds to be in stage shape. And you're a little bit above it and you're, it's taken you a year to get there. I say, why not? You know, some people need that, de need that time-based deadline. But if you look pretty good and you're just rushing it, that's a different thing, you know? So there's a lot of arguments for that. I support, you know, people with what they want to do on that. But I also have a standard where I'll put on stage and what I won't put on stage personally. Because, you know, I'm all for the transformation of lifestyle client. I love doing those. Actually, one of my favorite things to do is get girls ready for weddings. I think that that's like one of my funnest things to do. Like if, if I had to get a girl ready for nationals or get a girl ready for her wedding and, and I would probably pick get a girl ready for her wedding. I, it's, it's, a, it's just fun. They get these pictures that they last forever. It's like one time in their life. They're dedicated to the goal the same way. It's not as much pressure, right? It's just fun, you know? So I love transformations, but let's save those transformations for where they're supposed to be. For the contest, you are supposed to be the best physiques competing against the best physiques. And no one wants to be the least fit person at a fitness contest. I always say that you don't want to be the least fit person at a fitness contest. Um, but at the same time, hey, if you've lost 100 pounds, and you want to celebrate it, you know, by all, by all, by all means, go for it. I, I say you go for it and celebrate it. But yeah, I, this is a bodybuilding contest. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't only know how to play checkers and go to a chess tournament, you know, and it's, it is that that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're putting your physique against the best physiques out there in the state. You want to be prepared for that. Oftentimes I'll have people that'll say, oh, I don't really care. I just want to do it for me and whatever. And then when they leave, they, they leave, they went in feeling great and they'll leave being the less, the least in shape person at a fitness contest. And then they feel bad. Right. And I'm like, if they would have just never stepped on stage, they would have never, they would have been confident and happy and all these things. But then they leave the stage and they're like, I was, I still have so much more to go. And they don't, it's a different mindset. Right. So I'm not a fan of it, but I, I get, I get the arguments for it, you know? So I guess there's my take on it. I say be ready if you're in entering the, the bodybuilding contest. And if not, enter something else. Um, okay, so I'm just going through these questions as they come in. Oh, this is kind of fun. <clears throat> this question is from the Valkyrie. Uh, what was the process of breaking into the bikini coach industry? That is an interesting question. That's actually kind of crazy. Okay. This is my answer to the bikini, how I became a bikini coach. I didn't pick bikini. Bikini picked me. <laughs> Straight up. I had no, oh, dude, I had no choice in the matter. I was just good at it for some reason. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, what's crazy is uh, I, I never even, you know, you gotta remember I started in like nutrition stores. I started working in nutrition stores in 1998, dude. Like I was 16 years old working in nutrition stores. It wasn't even like internet. So like all, I, all there was was bodybuilders. That's all I worked with. I worked with bodybuilders and I was like this skinny bodybuilder, this like skinny wannabe bodybuilder, right? At 16. And all I wanted to do was like be in cool with the bodybuilders because they were the cool guys. And I was like, you know, I was just, I was like a weird, I don't know, I was a weird kid. I was cool, but like I had no friends, you know, I just stayed to myself. I've always been a very like isolated person. I always just kept to myself. But in the gym, I was like, it was like my environment. I loved the gym environment, you know, and it was, it was, it was nice. It kept me off the streets and stuff and the neighborhood where I grew up wasn't too great. So the gym was like just a safe place. And it was all older dudes and then the muscle guys. And I was like, man, I can't wait to be big and muscular. So I would just read and read and read and try to like help these bodybuilders um, be better bodybuilders and help them with supplements and help them with nutrition and things like that. And they thought it was so cool that I was into it. And they were actually listening to me. And so when they started listening to me, it like made me feel, oh, I'm part of the cool guys, right? I'm part of the cool guys. And I was young and they were all like, you know, 30 year old bodybuilders and stuff. And I was like, you know, it was just, it made me feel good. It made me feel like for once I was like, I'm doing something that's like, I like, and I am helping people. And I'm like, I feel important, you know, I feel of use, you know? And, um, so that's all there was, you know? So, but I was a crappy bodybuilder too. So when I was like trying to be a better bodybuilder, I knew the more I researched, the more I got, um, the more I learned, the more of an advantage I'll have versus my, my shitty genetics, you know? And if I know more than everyone else, then I'll be a better bodybuilder myself. But then, you know, I wasn't even really like, 
I was helping people, but I wouldn't even consider it like coaching back. I was just helping people that came into the supplement store. And so, um, and people at my gym anyway, so down the road, you know, 10 years later, I'm helping bodybuilders. I'm helping figure competitors. I'm helping, you know, I'm helping anyone that's in the physique sport, but there wasn't any bikini, right? There wasn't men's physique. There wasn't women's physique. So, um, you know, it came out and then, um, I had this, I had a, uh, actually it was like one of my, I wouldn't say it's my first year. It was like my second, my second year doing like bikini coaching. Right. And I had this girl named Lauren, um, Lauren Atkins and she won Miss Colorado in like 2012, I think might've been 13. It was like my second year, maybe, maybe third year bikini coaching, something like that. And, um, what happened was we destroyed like every division that year. Like we just destroyed it. Right. And that was like my first, like, like multi-girl prep, like in, of, of bikini at that, like at one show having more than one girl. And right. And we knocked it out of the park. We won like four or five out of six divisions or something like that. And I was like, damn, like I've never had that much success by being a bodybuilding coach. Like you never win that many right in a row. And we won the title, right? So we won the title and all of our girls won. And then in Colorado, cause it wasn't like, so no one was online at that point. So there was a very few people that were online. It wasn't like a big thing. Like not everyone was an online coach. Like Instagram just started. And, um, <clears throat> I did pretty good. And then the next thing you know, everyone wanted me to be the bikini coach. And all of a sudden my team went from all men's physique guys, right? And like a couple figure girls and like one bikini girl to like all bikini girls and one men's physique guy. <laughs> Actually, we're like, yeah, it was, I remember you could see it in the pictures. It was so funny. Cause we have a picture of starting that year. It's on my desk, that desk, a uh, grab. Yeah, that one. And then, um, this is funny. This is like, 2012 here is if you guys can see this this is uh so check out check out how the team i was bringing this is like 2012 you guys can see it this is uh it's all guys and one figure competitor <laughs> it's all guys and one figure and then is that later on in the year i don't think that was the same year uh that's really funny and um then it went yeah so then it went like Right away, like after that, after I started crushing it with bikini and I started to realize I was good, it went to like maybe 50-50 men's physique and uh, bikini. This is, this is like 2012, I think. Yeah, I think it's 2012, maybe 13. And um, the next thing you know, it was like all bikini. And I just kept winning bikini. We just won it. I mean, we won like one year. There was like 11 shows. We won seven of the overalls in, in, um, in Colorado. And then we started going online. I bought a little computer. And I was like, oh, I think I'll try this online thing. Because this, this girl I was dating, her name was Kelly, if she's listening, I'm probably not. <laughs> um, she was doing her, her stuff online. And I was, like, um, I was like, what do you mean you send your pictures in to this guy? She's like, yeah, I just send my pictures. He makes these adjustments. And I was like, really? And like, there's no, and there's all these things that weren't there. The calories weren't there in her diet. The, um, there was no measurements. There was all these, all these things were, I was like, I could do this so much better like I started thinking about it. And then the next thing you know, I had a client in Texas and then that girl did good. And the next thing you know, I was like, man, it's crazy how it went. So yeah, it went from, it was not my choice. I had no intentions of being a bikini coach. Like I was not even a, a thought of being a bikini coach. It was not a goal, a thought of anything. And then um, I think, you know, it's funny because Jeff Taylor, he's the chairman of, uh, of Colorado. And he was like, you know what? I think, cause I, I grew up mostly without a dad, you know, like he was not in the picture. And um, it was all women, you know, my mom, it was funny, I think my mom, my sister, my aunt lived with us. I had all, all female pets, like everything was girls, right? <laughs> it's like everything. And, uh, and I think and Jeff Taylor, he was like, I don't know. He's like, you're just seem to be really good, like with women and most bodybuilders aren't. Most of them are uh, like, there's just something you just, you just have a knack for it. You know, he's like, you should just go with it. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm not resisting it at all. So, you know, whatever. And so anyway, uh, yeah, bikini, bikini picked me, man. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't ever try to be a bikini coach, but I just, I know where my skill set is, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm world level at the bikini game. There's like, you know, there's no denying that. So uh, I just go with it and hopefully one day I'll be the best there was, you know, but um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things I need to accomplish before I can say that. So uh, anyway, that was a fun question. I didn't, <laughs> that, that funny, that story is always really funny to me because it happened so like quickly and so um unintentionally and it just like everything just lined up the way that, like 
nothing nothing would happen that way so smooth again. Like nothing would it would have to go that way. It's funny. You want to see what's really funny? These shirts. I'm going to show you this too. This is funny. If anyone has one of these, like, if someone still has one of these, I would I would buy it from you. <laughs> these shirts. These shirts. All right. Those shirts was was uh, when I was just getting started, and I um, I hand printed those shirts myself. I hand printed them. I would because I didn't have any money. You know, I didn't have any money back then, and so uh, I you know I rented this uh, screen tr- screen printing shop. You know, and I bought these shirts for like three dollars a piece for the shirts, and the screen printing shop would let me rent it for twenty five dollars an hour. Uh, the screen printing shop, and so. I learned how to screen print and I bought like 300 shirts for the year. Right. And then, um, I just hand printed them like as fast as I could. Cause it was like $25 an hour. And that was a lot to me. And I was working for 24 out of fitness and I was lucky if I made $20 a session that from them, you know? So it's like, you know, it eat up your whole day is worth the work. So, and then I would print them all off and then I would just give them out. And, um, you know, and then the people would show up and their friends would show up wearing those shirts. And it helped us with like having some like localized, you know, brand recognition type of thing. Cause back then it was all local, you know, now it's online, but, uh, it was funny is that I look back at those and like, there was a lot of sweat went into those things. I mean, printing, I was printing 300 shirts for a whole, for <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But now it's just like, yeah, just, I just, I, it's so funny how it changes, right? Courtney comes in here and she's like, Hey, I got an idea for a shirt. I'm like, here you go. Here's the, go get them printed. Like, I don't even look at them anymore. You don't need it. It's so funny. Anyway. So that's the story. Uh, but I always tell everyone who asks like about success in the industry and I've had a lot of it and I've had a lot of success in other areas of my life, but a lot of failures too. Like I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been pretty lucky in life. Um, and I've had a lot of, a lot of success. I've been, I've been well off. I always tell her, I've been well off like two to three times and I've been dead broke zero, nothing, uh, two times in my life. So, well, I mean, I guess this building too got me down to zero. So I don't know. Yeah. Like three, three, two or three times. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of sacrifice to get there, but I always tell everyone it took, uh, it took me 13 years to become an overnight sensation. <laughs> that's, that's how long it takes. It took you. Everyone's like, you know, how did it take, you know, you just got really, you just got happened really bad. I mean, dude, it, took 13 years of grinding to, in order to actually make it. So if you're out there and you're trying to be successful in whatever it is, whether it's this coaching, whatever, like it's going to take some time, you know, it's, you're going to have to, you're going to have to swallow some crow and, and not be prideful, live below your means. If, and, but anything worth, uh, anything worth doing, you know, anything worth doing is worth the sacrifice for sure. Like in the end, you know, so uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Honestly, I, I feel like if I didn't sacrifice and, and like, sleep on my gym floor because I didn't have a house when I sold everything like that. I wouldn't appreciate it as much as I do now. You know, if I just like, it just kept going and, you know, and then I see a lot of people who want that and they just don't ever do anything to get it. They don't sacrifice, they're not willing to sacrifice or go through the discomfort of it. And it's just like contest prep. If you're willing to go through some sacrifice and discomfort, you're going to have something that, you know, that you shouldn't have, which is amazing Greek goddess physique, you know? And so, uh, you know, I went through the sacrifice and killed myself and printed shirts and had no money and no income for like seven years where I barely paid myself. And now I have a contest prep center, right? So it's like the same thing with all things. And I think that bodybuilding taught me that, you know, the sacrifice is worth it. Um, okay. Going through these questions. Sorry, guys. Okay. So best tips to gain muscle without fat when you're skinny and want to look more fit. Okay. From the, from the fierce guard, gardenia, <laughs> gardenia. I like that first fierce gardenia. Um, so the, uh, here's the thing about building muscle without gaining fat. Okay. And this is one thing I want everyone to think about because a lot of people still think bulking is necessary to gain muscle. And a lot of people still think you have to actually gain, um, you have to be in a caloric surplus. The only way to gain muscle is in a caloric surplus. Well, that is not the truth, okay? You can gain muscle in a caloric deficit. Now, can you gain muscle optimally in a caloric deficit? Probably not. Is the scenario different per person based on their level of experience in the gym? Absolutely. So let's give you some examples here. Okay, I have someone who is 50 pounds overweight. It's their first year working out. And they want to lose body fat and gain muscle, right? What's the best approach to them? Give them extra calories so maybe they gain extra body fat 
but also gain muscle or to diet them down and give them weightlifting as an extra calorie burner and hopefully they build some muscle. Well, for sure, I would give that person who has a lot of weight to lose uh, a calorie deficit because that's going to be the goal, the primary goal is to lose body fat, right? Well, that guy can also build muscle while in a caloric deficit much easier than, let's say, uh, you know, a, a, a Phil Heath or someone who's been lifting for so many years while in, it, while in a caloric deficit. This guy, any stimulus he does, the body's going to respond pretty well to. So he can maximize. I mean, he'll do, obviously, he'll do a little better if he had a caloric, a caloric surplus, but with him, just starting to lift weights, he's going to create a stimulus that his body hasn't been having for a long time. He's going to be able to put on muscle. So look at that and where you're at in your career too. If you're in your first year of bikini competing, your first year of lifting, you probably can put on some muscle while dieting probably pretty easily. You probably put on a good amount too. Now let's go into the advanced lifter, which most of you are. Can you build muscle while in a caloric deficit? <clears throat> okay. So first off, let's look at how much muscle can a bikini competitor or a men's physique guy, who's a smaller men's physique guy, let's say, muscle build, period, right? So let's not look at who's going to build more muscle, deficit, or surplus. How much muscle can you build, period, right? That's the first question. So if you're an advanced bikini competitor, and let's say you're petite, and you're like 120 pounds, right, the average girl, you're going to put on about one pound of muscle in a perfect scenario, about one pound of muscle every 45 days, okay? That's kind of the rule of thumb. So that means you're, you're, you're basically synthesizing 10 grams of amino acids per day and turning it into skeletal muscle per day. That's pretty good. That's a pretty solid amount for an advanced lifter. So you take 45 days, that's about one pound <clears throat> of actual skeletal muscle. But what do you hear? What do you hear, right? You hear about people trying to build one pound of muscle a week. They're like, I'm just going to gain a pound like a 120 pound girl will say, I'm going to put on one pound a week to gain muscle, right? I'm going to put on two pounds a week and gain muscle, two pounds a week. So why do you think you can put on so much muscle? Like, why do you think it's that easy? No one puts on that much muscle, right? Two pounds of muscle per week for the regular natural bikini competitor, even enhanced bikini competitor can't put on two pounds of muscle per week, right? So why are we gaining that much weight in the first place, right? Well, let's, let's break it down and let's be honest with each other. You're gaining that much weight because you like the way food tastes, right? That's just the reality of things. It's fun to say you're in the off season and, uh, and, and, and eat whatever you want, right? And then you could justify it by saying, hey, I'm bulking. I'm gaining two pounds a week, right? And you're just eating what you want to eat. That's cool. If you want to do that, that's up to you. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, it's wrong. I don't, it's not my method. I wouldn't do that. I would try to keep someone as lean as possible in the off season and gain as much muscle. So let's, let's take the example of, okay, you can gain one pound every 45 days. So one Let's, let's also agree on that. If you can gain only one pound of muscle, if you're the average bikini competitor, who's a smaller bikini competitor, of course, one pound of muscle every 45 days, do we need to gain more weight than that, right? And will any more weight than that one pound equal more muscle, right? And the answer to that is once you reach that certain point, that certain threshold of where your body can optimally build muscle in calories, any calories past that point are going to be just fat. And you gaining body fat does not contribute to you gaining muscle, right? So we can agree that there's a point of calories that is the optimal calorie point where you can get the maximum benefit. And then as soon as you go past that, it starts being stored energy, fat, right? So what's that number? That's the real question. What number can I have at maintenance calories where I'm still gaining the optimal amount of muscle, where I'm not going in and excessively gaining body fat, right? And so... The first part of that is, hey, you have to be realistic with how much muscle you can gain in the first place, right? And that's going to be, unfortunately, not as much as you think it is, you know? If you're gaining, if a, if a girl gains six pounds of lean mass in a year, holy shit, that's a good year. <laughs> that girl kicks some ass that year. If she gains six pounds of muscle in a year, and you know what you would look like with six more pounds of muscle on you? It's, it's night and day. It's totally different. But people want to diminish that, and they're like, oh, I'm going to put on 15, 20 pounds in the offseason. I'm like, that's not how it works. Go get six pounds of ultra lean meat at the store, right? Go look. Next time you go to the grocery store, look at six pounds of ultra lean, like, meat in, like, like a, in a beef, right? It's like this. It's like a ton. It looks like a, almost the size of, like, a small watermelon, right? It, you're telling me that much muscle is not going to be noticeable on you, and you need to gain 20 pounds of muscle? No way, <laughs> not even close, right? So 
we have to like take a step back and say, okay, what's realistic for me to gain muscle? How, why am I gaining so much body fat? Am I doing it because it's more fun to eat food and I'm justifying it with, through a bulking, right? And how much muscle can I actually gain and what will it do for my body if I gain just three pounds of muscle, right? So, I mean, you could look back, look back at, um, I mean, we talk about it with Ashley. Unfortunately, she's not here today, but look back at, on, on, at Ashley in 2018, gosh, I'm forgetting the year now, 2018, um, and then look at her, how much muscle she has now. Like she's been dieting this whole time doing, you know, sometimes 14 shows in a year. She's put on only since 18, she was, she was 117 on stage. I think the heaviest she's been on stage is like 123. And that was like, her conditioning was best at like 122, right? So we're talking 18, 19, like five pounds, give or take of muscle in the period of a couple years, right? how much different does she look now? How much fuller are her shoulders? How much better are her tie-ins? How much better are her glutes? Her waistline smaller, right? You don't need these crazy body composition changes of 15, 20 pounds up to gain, you know, and then you net the same one pound above stage weight. Like you don't need to go through all this. And I feel like, I feel like a lot of times we're putting it right in your face. We're like, here's the example at the highest level it could possibly be at. And, and people aren't listening and I don't understand it, you know? It's in your face, guys. It's it. The example is right in your face all the time, every day, show after show, year after year, not gaining a bunch of weight, staying lean and getting prepped for three weeks in a show. Like, have we not proved that it works at this point? <laughs> like, what do we got to do? <laughs> you know what I mean, like it's, it's in your face. You can make improvements. Yeah. You can put on lean mass and it's like, there is a better way, you know, at least I think it's a better way. You know, if you're serious about it, it's a better way. If you're, if you're more serious about lifestyle, and you're more serious about, you know, like, hey, I want to just have fun. And, the, and that might be a better way for you. But we're talking about the competitor and you being serious and like how most of you talk, at least. That's, to me, the best way, right? Um, I talked to Anya over the weekend about doing another prep. And she's like, you know, we're, we're notorious for doing eight-week preps. I think we can do it. I'm only up. I think she's only up six pounds from stage weight right now. So it's like, you know, yeah. If she wants to jump into a prep, yeah, we'll probably get it ready in six weeks, maybe even five, you know? So like, because she's not going to gain 20 pounds of lean mass, right? She's going to gain a pound. So just, you know, let's, uh, let's think about things logically here. Just like the question where I said, what is a contest prep? It's mainly just you losing some body fat. Like, let's think about that logically. Do I need to go through all this to lose all that body fat just because I'm doing a show? And it's funny because I, I used to do this at personal trainer classes, so in my career, I've done a whole bunch of different things in fitness. One of them, which was really cool, it was a real honor to do that, was to get new trainers who just got certified and sit them down in a class and talk to them about exercise mechanics and program design and all these different things and client issues and special conditions, whatnot. And then I would get to the extremes, right? I would say, okay, <clears throat> on one side of the board, we have contest prep, Right what do you do for the contest prep? And on the other side of the board, we have 200 pound woman who should be 140 pounds. What do you do for the 200 pound woman that should be 140 pounds, right? And it was funny because the, the trainers would think logically about the 200, 200 pound woman who's risk of dying much faster rate than the person who's already in shape doing a contest, right? So this is what would happen. I would say, okay, 200-pound woman, what do we do? And they would say, oh, well, let's switch her sodas to diet soda. Let's have her put water in her orange juice and, and have 50-50 water with orange juice. And let's, you know, let's, um, let's switch her carbs a little bit and let's reduce those and maybe go to like some cauliflower carbs with, with half rice. And have all these very logical, all these very logical things, right? And I was like, that's a great, these are great ideas. You know, go half rice, half cauliflower rice, right? Reduce her total calories. So going dark chicken, go light chicken, little things. They all made, it just made a lot of sense. Reducing total calories, right? Do baked chips instead of, fr instead of fried chips. It was like all these like really good ideas, right? And it was like, it was cool because I always learn a couple of them too, like different ideas. It was cool. Like people would come up with stuff. And I say, okay, now what about this contest prep person who needs to lose 15 pounds to get ready for her stage? Who's, give you an even better example. Let's say she needs to lose 15 pounds. She's 120 pounds on stage. She's a female, whatever, right? It's like, oh, well, she needs to do fasted cardio in the morning. For 45 minutes, she needs to eat tilapia, asparagus, 
She needs to take fat burners. She needs to do another cardio session after she works out, right? And the list would just keep going and going and going and going. Like supplements and this and that and do two-a-day workouts and this and that. And I'm like, and I was like, okay. And I would just keep writing them down. I'd write them down on the board. And then I would say, okay, all right, I want everyone to stop and I want you guys to think about something for a second. What's different about this girl who's getting ready for a show's fat versus this girl who needs to lose 60 pounds of fat? What's the difference between their fat? And then everyone would be like, you know, how everyone here is probably have that aha moment right now, right? Everyone's like, oh, yeah, there is nothing different about their fat. Is her fat different? Is her fat not 3,500 calories, right? And this girl's fat being 3,500 calories? Is there a difference there? And if so, why is the approach so different, right? And so people would have to, like, take a step back for a second and be like, look, you're just trying to lose fat on both of them, right? Now you have someone who's already in good shape who doesn't need to lose that much fat and you have someone who's at serious health risks that you're giving easy street to. If anything, you would switch those two and give, give the girl who's at risk of all these problems the more extreme diet, at least for the beginning of it, right? And then give the girl who's over here just needing to lose 15 pounds a much more relaxed diet because she just needs to lose 15 pounds. She needs to lose one pound a week for 15 weeks, Right? So the way that we think about contest prep is wrong. You know, it's just losing body fat. So what's the right way of thinking about it then, right? If I'm, you know, you're like, okay, Adam, well, what's the right way, Mr. Smarty Pants? <laughs> well, the right way is what are we doing, right? We're trying to lose fat. We're trying to maintain as much lean mass as possible. And we're trying to do that with as little cardio as possible, with as much many calories as possible so I could sustain the result after. If you're doing these extremes and you're getting ready for prep and you're blowing up every time, you probably have to look at how you're approaching your prep because an unsustainable method at getting results is unsustainable to, re to keep those results because you have to change eventually back to what you were doing or back to something similar. You can't, you can't maintain doing two hours of cardio a day and eating 800 calories, so of course you can't maintain the results that came with that. It's just common sense, right? So if we're just losing body fat, why are we taking such extremes to just lose body fat, right? And so we got to think about this whole thing a lot differently now, guys. Like everyone's, I don't think what we've, I don't think that we've got to that point where people are really thinking about how things are that are, are so simple in contest prep. Just lose fat. Just don't gain a bunch of fat. You're a fitness person. Why are you gaining so much fat in the off season? You know, why are you getting to that point where now you need these extremes? If you're a fitness person already, which you should already be a fitness person, if you're even considering doing a contest prep, why are you gaining so much body fat? That's something you got to figure out, right? That's something that you got to address because if you're really in this game for the long term and you want to be the top level or you want to get a pro car or you want to win an overall, whatever, like that requires you playing the sport year round, just like any sport does, you know? So anyway, I guess that's my TED talk on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I feel like it's still pretty powerful, right? It's still impactful. So, um, all right, let's see here. We got these, let's see. I want to see what the questions and comments are coming in at that point. Uh, so let's get to these Instagram comments. If it's any, if it's anyone besides, besides Kimber here, <laughs> leave it me hearts. Uh, so let's see here. Got a lover. All right, let's see. All right, guys, um, I'm going to answer these uh, Instagram questions. If you got any of them you want to throw in. All right, here's a question from um, Shan Young. Haven't read it yet, so let's see if it's a, it's a good one or if it's even appropriate. <laughs> All right, <laughs> when you go from a dieting, uh, dieting to a maintenance phase, how much change should there be? Well, that's a good question. Do you normally have people eat a lot more to decrease and, and decrease their cardio, or should your maintenance be minimally changed? Okay, that's a great question. All right, so uh, the question being how basically the question is, you know, how many calories do you increase from how many calories do you increase from um, contest prep to a maintenance phase? Well, okay, so here's the thing. The longer you're in a caloric deficit, okay, so if you're in a, here's, and it doesn't matter how long, like how big that deficit is. So let's give you an example. Um, easy numbers. You burn, your maintenance calories are 2,000 calories when you start prep, all right? So your maintenance calories are 2,000 calories when you start prep. 
easy numbers, you're eating a thousand calories for a prep, right? This is not a realistic scenario. So you have a thousand calorie deficit, right? And your body's going to slowly start adapting to that thousand calorie uh, deficit through this process called adaptive thermogenesis. It's going to happen and your body's going to just, you know, it's just a way of finding a way to survive, right? You're going to burn towards the end. You're going to burn a little bit less calories, mainly because your body's trying to slow down a little bit and trying to put you on the couch more through this thing called NEAT, non-exercise activity induced thermogenesis, right? So the, 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 the bigger the deficit, the more likely your body's going to get tired to try to make up for that adaption. Also, hormonally, some things will happen where you burn a little bit less calories, um, things like that. So, all right, so now you went from 2,000 calories at, at your maintenance phase at the, very, at the very start of prep down to 1,000 calories of consumption, right? So at the end of prep, if you are maintaining any deficit whatsoever, okay, so let's want to go into this really clearly for people. Any deficit is going to require an adaption, even if that deficit is less, okay? So let's say instead of 1,000 calories and you just finished your show, you were at a 1,000 calorie deficit, and let's say you went to 1,500 calories, right? So your body was burning 2,000 calories. Now you're eating 1,500. So you're like, yeah, I increased my calories by 500. So I'm in my post-show diet and my reverse diet and my recovery phase and whatnot. Wrong, you're not. You're in a caloric deficit still. Okay, so your body is still adapting. Yes, it might be adapting at a slower rate, but you're still in a caloric deficit, which means you're still adapting, right? So any caloric deficit whatsoever will mean that your body will have to adapt to it to some capacity, right? Obviously, a caloric deficit of like 10 calories is probably not going to be that big of an adaption, but we're talking, you know, hundreds of calories. Yeah, of course, it's a body's way of surviving, right? So, okay, so the the agreement that is out there with most people is that to, in order to get to that corrective phase, you need to be at maintenance calories. Now here's where the, the conundrum comes in. What's maintenance calories once you've been dieting for a heart for a long period of time and doing a ton of cardio, right? That's the question. That's where things really, really change, right? So when you're, you started off a prep at 2000 calories maintenance, when you finish the prep, you might only be at like 1300 calorie, 1400 calorie maintenance. You know what I mean? So yeah, you're going to increase your calories to that. But the people who are doing like 100 calories, 200 calories a week, right when they get done with their prep, they're probably still in a caloric deficit. And I would try to get out of that as fast as I can. Now, it's going to be very different per person. You know, I'm, you know, I, I diet some people at, I mean, I have some bikini competitors dieting at 2,500 calories, right? That's not that big of a deficit for their maintenance. They might be burning 3,000 and they're just, you know, they're just fast metabolic machines, right? They're the people that everyone hates, right? They're like, man, that girl does 10 minutes of cardio and gets in shape for shows. I've prepped pros that have done no cardio for shows and ate over 2000 calories, two of them. It's crazy. So like, it's just, it's just, it, there's some people are just built differently, right? But, um, they're not going to have a big, you know, they're not going to, they're going to go right to maintenance calories. Like right away, I'll put them at like right back to 3000 because they've been eating 2,500. So it's not that big of a deal. But if someone was like a grind prep, let's say someone was a super, super grind prep, and they're eating a thousand calories because they had to eat a thousand calories to get in shape or whatever. Well, that person, I'm going to be a lot more sensitive about bringing them out. The first thing I want to do is bring down their cardio, right? I want to bring, if that person's doing an hour of cardio a day, I want to get that down to like 30 minutes, like right away, right? And then slowly let their body adapt to that. The worst thing would be, okay, reduce that person's cardio down to 10 minutes, three times a week, and then have their calories right up to what we think is maintenance calories. That's a recipe for disaster right? We think as maintenance calories be 2000 that scenario. She's probably only burning like 1300 and now she's gaining 700 calories per day. And then also moving a lot less so gaining probably another 500 calories per day on top of that. Right. And then she's going to have a cheat meal <laughs> on top of that because she's now she could, she has freedom. Right. So now she's gaining a 1500 to a thousand, 2000 calories a day on those days. Right. So that's where the rapid weight gain happens. Right. So the goal should be to go right to maintenance calories of what the new maintenance calories are which is going to be an adapted state from the, the harder you diet, the more adaptions are going to occur. So you'll slowly bring those calories up, but you can't be shy about going to maintenance calories. So how do you figure that out, right? Well, that comes down to you tracking your measurements as always. When the show's not done, when the show's done, you're not done. I always tell people, hey, if you're in a 16-week prep, really you're in a 24-week prep because you have to still consider this after the show's over because if you want to avoid blowing up, you know, you want to go through that proper correctional phase. I call it a post-show diet. You want to go through that proper correctional phase 
That way you don't just lose all that hard work within, you know, three weeks time because you had no plan after that, right? So that's going to be the important part of it is instead of looking at prep as 16 weeks and then freedom, look at prep as, you know, if you're doing a 16 week prep, look at it at, let's say 20 weeks, you know, say, okay, I'm going to prep for 20 weeks and put your mindset around 20 weeks, right? Because that's where, that's where we keep going wrong. And that's where we keep having these talks, right? Of, of people needing to go through such extremes to get in shape for shows when it really shouldn't be that much at all, you know? So, um, okay, here, let's see. I'm gonna go over one more and we'll be done for the day. I feel, this is kind of fun. It's a lot more talking when Ashley's not here. <laughs> I don't think I'll be doing it again, too, at least not too often. But we're, I think we'll do one if I'm ever gone with Ashley where she does like all bikini-based questions too. Like it needs, it's, it's, it's nice. Okay. Oh, here's a cool one. All right, I think I'm gonna blow some people's minds here. Um, this one is, yeah, should I go into this? I'll go into it. It's just one of those ones that's like, it could go for a while. All right, well, let's go into it. Forget it. All right, so someone's asking basically how to work the lower abs. I don't know if I can even do this without a diagram. All right, I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> all right, so here's the thing. Um, if, so I'm going to go into, so there's this thing because called an all or none theory of muscle contraction, right? So all or none theory of muscle contraction um, basically states that a muscle will either contract or it will not contract. It cannot partially contract, okay? So think about that for a second. Think you have, think about having like an electrical wire and at one end, you send a volt of electricity. What's gonna happen at the other end? The volt of electricity will travel and you'll get shocked if you're holding it, right? The current will travel through that wire all the way through it, or it will not go through the wire at all. One of the two. It can't be only part of the wire, okay? So if I get guys that'll come up to me like, hey, how do I work my lower bicep? You do it by working the upper bicep. There, it's one fiber unit all the way attached from top to bottom. There's not separate attachments through that muscle. So even the abs, they have a, a, a sternal origin and they attach on the pubis, right? So that is one grouping of muscle fibers from top to bottom, okay? They have a, right, they have the little groove in them, but it's, it's one attached muscle fiber. So all or none theory of muscle fiber contraction, right? Can I specifically work my lower abs significantly more than my upper abs based on the exercise selection? How do I only send an electrical signal to half that wire? That's the question, right? You can't right? You either contract all of it or you contract none of it, right? So why is it that we approach that muscle differently? Have you ever asked anyone who, has anyone ever asked you, hey, how can I work like this part of my upper shoulder versus <laughs> more than my lower part of my insertion of my shoulder? It's the same question though, right? And it's a ridiculous question. Why is that one, why is that one <laughs> not talked about, right? Everyone talks about, it. well, you just naturally store more body fat on your lower abs are harder to see. You just store more body fat there, right? If a girl wants to measure her waistline for the smallest part of the waistline, where does she measure it at? Right around her rib cage. Because that's where she stores less body fat. It's also going to have the lowest impact on change because it stores less body fat there, right? So the way that you're going to see those lower abs better is you keep working your abs. It doesn't matter which one you do, what ab exercise you do. Just work your abs. They're going to contract. The lower abs are going to contract too, right? Um, once you contract those abs, if you're not seeing them yet, you're probably not lean enough yet. It's not that you're not working them that good. You're probably working them just as good. Now, the lower abs are also less, uh, the, the, the actual muscle and how developed it is, it's just less muscular, less, there's less, like, uh, I guess you'd say, like, separation, the lower it seems to get, right, for most people. So, yeah, the develop, if you develop your muscles, you develop your abs 100%, the abs on top will be a little bit thicker, right? Just it's, I don't know what the reasoning for that, just the, the anatomy of the muscle. It's just a little bit thicker up there than at the bottom. Um, and so you're going to, and they're, they're bigger at the top than the bottom. So that is just what you're going to, you're going to run into, you know, people just think, oh, I'm not working them. No, you just still have more body fat there. And the muscle itself isn't as, isn't as big at the bottom there. So I'm um, just like the quads. There's bigger parts of the quads than there is, you know, on, on other parts of the quads. So it's just, you know, all the muscles have different shapes. You know, the bicep has its, you know, some guys have a peak and they don't. They're like, how do I work my peak more? Well, 
Um, you either have it or you don't. You work the whole muscle. If the peak gets bigger, the peak gets bigger. Like you can't just work the peak. You know what I mean? So like it's, it's you're the born with it or you're not, you know, that's why you, you'd see some guys with awesome peaks. Like you see, uh, you know, you see Ronnie Coleman had an amazing bicep peak, but you see Flex Wheeler and his was like a round bubbly bicep. It, and it's not like Flex Wheeler wasn't like trying to get a peak or something like that. He wasn't like purposely avoiding it. It's just how he was built, right? That muscle is just built that way. You either work it or you don't. It's like Ronnie Coleman found a secret recipe to work just the peak. It's just how his bicep was shaped, right? So it's the same thing. And that's called the all or none theory of muscle contraction. You could look it up. Um, at least that's how I address that one. But yeah. Um, now, people will say, oh, can't you work your quad more or whatever? Yeah. Now, we're not talking about the a single muscle. If I were talking about areas of a muscle, you know, when you're moving out on the muscle on the outside or inside of the muscle, yes, you can work that at different different amounts, right? If you turn your legs one way more, you can target that muscle fiber more directionally, right? So yes, that is a thing. It's not like you contract your quads on a leg extension and they all contract or none of them contract and you can't contract any better. You can, if you turn your legs, whatever, you can put them more in the direction of the load. And yes, you can get better contractions on, on those, right? But um, we're not talking about um, an upper or lower in that scenario. We're talking about the side to side, right? So on the, like the different lateral heads. So um, there we go. I think considering I didn't have a diagram up that explained it pretty decently, I guess, is that it? All right, one more time. Um, no, I've already answered that question. All right, guys, I guess that's it. I'm gonna get back. I'm gonna get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun though. You guys, if you guys like this format, maybe I'll do it once in a while. I'm going to be doing some other things on, um, some kind of podcast type stuff soon here too. Um, but thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. If I'm ever out of town now, Ashley owes me one. Ashley, if you're listening to this, you owe me one. I don't know. She's, I usually talk more in the podcast. So I don't know how that would go. Right. All bikini question. She's pretty good though. She's pretty solid. Yeah. But I think we'll do like an all bikini one one day. And then when I'm out of town, at least now we have a, we have a setup for it. So do you guys like this? Do you guys hate it? Leave it in the comments below. I'm desperate for subscribers. <laughs> I just sign on the street, subscribe, subscribe and like, <laughs> I'll see you guys later.